Hey, good Saturday morning, my friends. Taking a live look outside over the downtown Denver skyline from Coors Field. We are at the start of a heat wave. Apparently it's going to get very, very hot. And I actually have not been paying attention, Keely, this morning. Uh, I was trying to make plans yesterday and somebody said we should go outside. And then they looked yeah. again. They said, oh my gosh, it's going to be like 96 degrees. Never mind. Yeah, today <laughs> it's going to be warm today. I have to say we got a lot of sunshine. Temperatures are going to soar into the upper 90s, possibly record breaking. We'll talk about that in just a second. Let's head outside right now where it's 65. Very pleasant start to this Saturday. But yeah, we are going to warm up nicely. So our forecast high today, 98 degrees. The record high is 100. That was said back in 2013, so we are going to be dangerously close to it, if not meet it in some areas, obviously. So, yeah, it's going to be a hot day. Make sure you uh, plan a cool down this afternoon. HD Doppler radar showing nothing happening out there. We really are waking up to a beautiful start to the Saturday. Really no uh, clouds out there yet. That will change as we head into the afternoon. So, again, mostly sunny, your forecast for today. Hot and 98 degrees your forecast high. We are going to be warming up nicely. Plenty of sunshine, no clouds in the picture until about the afternoon. Then we'll start to see a few more clouds move in. Possibly an isolated shower as well, mainly south of the metro area, up in the uh, uh, up in the high country, as well as out to the east. But we are going to be in store for a beautiful day, partly cloudy overnight. Just a chance for a shower to move in across the I-25 corridor. Maybe an isolated storm, but those mostly out across the eastern plains. With overnight lows dropping into the low 60s. We talked about that heat wave. We'll, we'll talk about how long it will last coming up in your full forecast in just a bit. All right, Keely, thank you so much. On well, the overnight, a deputy in Clear Creek County is now on administrative leave after shooting a suspect late last night. It all began when deputies arrived to a motorist assist near Main Street and North Garfield Street in Silver Plume. Deputies tried to break out the car windows and remove a knife, and then deputies say the suspect rearmed himself with a rock and a second knife. Deputies say they began with less lethal bean bags and a taser. Deputies say that's when the suspect tried to stab an officer and was fatally shot. The Colorado Bureau of Investigation is conducting the investigation. The identity of the suspect will be released after family members are notified. Littleton police are asking for the public's help in finding a missing senior. 93 year old William McCandless has been missing since yesterday morning. He lives in Denver and was seen leaving Littleton Hospital. Police say McCandless is white male, 5'10, 156 pounds, with gray hair and blue eyes. It is believed he is traveling his gray 2017 Toyota Camry, Colorado plate ACL 4479. He has had memory loss over the last couple of years, they say. Well, a new kind of testing is coming to more than a thousand schools and hundreds of daycare centers across Colorado. They want to know what's in their water. Our very, our very own Anusha Roy, excuse me, looked at an old issue taking on new urgency. Something as basic as taking a drink of water from the drinking fountain, you know, it seems like such an innocent act. And, and yet, Alexandra Simon said it's it. not so simple to make sure the water her kid is drinking is lead free. I honestly didn't realize it was such an issue, and I have a three year old that goes to daycare. She advocated for a new state law that requires 1,100 elementary schools and 450 child care centers to do mandatory tests of their drinking water for lead. Most parents, um, myself included, like when I talk to them about it, are surprised that this is an issue. But the state started putting together a picture when 67 schools voluntarily started testing their water five years ago. Not all of the fixtures, but all of the schools found elevated lead levels. You know, what we found has been the norm is um, low levels of lead contamination in water or outdated standard. The problem was there wasn't enough money to help all of these schools fix the problem. This time around, though, it's different because of state dollars and federal COVID relief funds for both testing and fixes. And so that could be changing out fixtures. It could be putting on a filter. The Democratic um, representative, yeah. Emily Sirota, a bill sponsor, said the law is still falling short since it's going to first focus on pre-K through fifth graders and child care centers, not all grades. The state health department said the regulatory limit on lead is 15 parts per billion, which is compared to one single drop of paint in a 13,000 gallon 
swimming pool. The new state law would reimburse districts if levels are five parts per billion or higher. Any level is too high. The state health department said the most common source of lead in these situations is corrosion from plumbing materials, which is most frequent in older bills. Well, over time, lead can cause uh, issues with your learning ability. It can make you irritable. So I don't think people should panic, but I do think they should be aware that this is a possibility. And while advocates are worried that lead levels can ebb and flow, so testing might miss problem spots. Well, I think this bill is a great first step forward. Anusha Roy reporting. Now, there is work around lead testing already, including Denver Water replacing some bad pipes. There's also a federal program for schools and child care, and some school districts run their own programs. Colorado hopes this will fill the gap for smaller districts and providers who need funds to make any needed repairs. Well, it has been two years since a man shot and killed 21 year old Isabella Thalas. She was out with her boyfriend walking her dog when all of it happened. There was a memorial in her honor last night. Her mother, Anna, organized it. She wanted it to be a healing space for anyone affected by gun violence. Well, that's the point of this uh, event is peace. So it's a matter of being able to put aside your personal differences and come together for the sake of one common goal in mind, and that's peace in our city. There is now a law named after Isabella. It actually requires gun owners to report lost or stolen firearms within five days. The gun used that day two years ago was stolen from a former Denver police officer. Well, you have another opportunity today to turn in any weapons you no longer want. Aurora and Denver City Council members are hosting their fourth gun buyback event of this year. It's going to be at Heritage Christian Center in Aurora. That's going to all start at 10 o'clock this morning. It's completely anonymous, by the way. After the guns are collected, they will be melted into gardening tools. And according to our partners at the Denver Gazette, people are doing this with more than 350 guns turned in during the first three months or their first three events. Excuse me. Organizers are planning monthly events, though, through October. The police chief who led the response to the school shooting in Uvalde, Texas, says he never thought he was in charge that day, and he said he's proud of his response. Pete Arredondo is the police chief for the school district. He has faced intense criticism for the police response the day 19 children and two teachers were sadly killed. In an interview with the Texas Tribune, he said he did not consider himself to be the scene's incident commander. He says he assumed another official took control, and he told the paper he left his two police radios outside. He said he wanted his hands free, and he was worried that the shooter would hear them if he had them. Investigators say police did not go into the school for more than an hour after the gunman went in. The New York Times reported police waited for protective equipment, even though they knew victims needed medical treatment. This weekend, there's going to be marches across the country calling for stricter gun laws after that shooting. The main March for Our Lives rally will be in Mar uh, Washington, D.C. There will be other marches, though, in New York, Los Angeles, and including right here in Denver. The march first started after the 2018 school shooting in Parkland, Florida. The latest marches are in response to the Uvalde shooting and the grocery store shooting in Buffalo. Nearly all of the Denver metro area, by the way, has high transmission levels of COVID. This all according to the CDC. Arapahoe, Adams, Douglas, and 11 other counties are all considered to have high transmission rates. The CDC recommends people mask up in those counties, and so does Denver Health Department. It's not a requirement, however. Now I think the goal is for everybody to be assessing their own situation and make good decisions based on that. Um, but I think it's, again, sort of thinking through these things in terms of, well, is it really worth the risk benefit? And a lot of that goes back again to individual health. Dr. Michelle Barron with UC Health says boosters are key and risk increases at larger events. That has not changed. And the CDC is lifting COVID testing requirements for international travelers coming to the U.S. That's going to end tomorrow. Travelers, including U.S. citizens, had to test negative before flying into the U.S. Airlines have repeatedly pushed the Biden administration to drop the requirement, arguing it was hurting the demand for international trips. Well, the first COVID vaccine doses for kids younger than five could start within two weeks. The FDA and CDC are expected to decide next week whether to clear the first vaccines for children under the age of five. And the White House wants those doses available immediately. Ten million doses were already made available for pre-order. Millions more will be ready to go in the coming weeks. The state health department says providers in Colorado have pre-ordered more than 45,000 doses so far.
And it is amazing what you can learn in the worst moments life can bring. A terminal diagnosis is helping a 20 year old from Greeley live. Marshall Zellinger introduces us to someone who inspired his own medical team when he needed them the most. Everyone gets recognized on graduation day. Austin, will you please stand? Not everyone gets singled out like Austin Walls. Austin has been through so much the past two years. The staff of Windsor High School is incredible. I mean, they, there's a lot of big hearts there. <laughs> For Austin, getting to graduation day took an unexpected detour. Partway through my uh, senior year, I threw off school pretty much entirely. I stopped showing up. I wasn't turning in assignments. His mood changed, and it wasn't just teenage angst for the kid who took the mental fitness test for the Marines. I was in the 96th percentile. They wanted to make me a, a nuclear physicist who would, uh, you know, be on one of the submarines monitoring nuclear weapons. I mean, whew, right? He was mentally fit until he wasn't. All of a sudden, he just did not want to go to school. He wasn't turning things in. He had no interest in the Marines. They would be knocking at the door. He wouldn't answer. And I couldn't figure out what was going on. August 25th, 2020, I was when I collapsed and had my first seizure. August 25th, 2020, the day Austin and his mom found out what was causing his behavioral changes. I have a glioblastoma. It's a stage four high-grade glioma brain cancer. For most people, it is just, just bad luck. Most stories have a, here's what we learned for the next person moment. As Austin's doctor, Adam Green, explains, this really isn't one of those stories. Families always want to know, you know, kind of what caused this, right? And, and, and is there anything we could have done differently? And, and the answer is, is really no. There's something very special about uh, when you really come to a point where you have to stare death in the face, it makes you realize how much you have to live for. It is that outlook that got the attention of Austin's medical team. No matter how he was feeling, he always had a positive attitude. He was always very polite. So when it came time to pick a patient to be part of a UC Health sponsored American Cancer Society fundraiser at Coors Field, Austin was positively the choice. Austin is doing so well because of his outlook on life right now. He even inspired more than just an invitation to Coors Field. We all wanted to go to his high school graduation. Austin Cole Walls. They were there as Austin was recognized for his accomplishments that go beyond graduation. In my mind, I shouldn't even really be here. I mean, it's, it's a miracle that I'm still here. That was Marshall Zellinger reporting. Now, according to Austin's doctor, life expectancy with Austin's type of tumor is 12 to 18 months. He's 21 months past his first treatment and says he feels fantastic, by the way. That fundraiser at Coors Field raised $255,000 for the American Cancer Society.